You're in the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. <laughs> With Gene and Jay Randall Murphy, and I was about to call him something else. Welcome back to the Paracast. Nothing offensive, by the way. So last week, we had some nice reaction to the appearance of Calvin Parker of Pascagoula, Mississippi fame on the Paracast. Of course, that episode occurred in October of 1973. And after all these years, he's a little bit older, not been super well in recent years, wants to leave a legacy, which is why he wrote a book about it for the Flying Disc Press. So that's where it stands. One of our listeners, though, thought that maybe we should have asked more penetrating questions about what the alien, quote unquote, look like, what the aliens look like and things like that. I kind of thought that this has been mentioned so many thousands of times, maybe not. What do you think, Randall? Well, like I uh, said on the forum there, uh, those are the kind of questions that would have been nice to ask if we had had more time to do so. And the thing is, is that episode just seemed to fly by for me. There just wasn't enough time to get all those little details in. So we did the best we could also to uh, take the suggestions of, of another one of our foreign people and just let Calvin tell his story for you know the good first half of the show. So it's not to interrupt him all the time um, and uh, digging into little details that kind of ruin the, the context and the flow of the story. This is a story that has been published and republished and discussed for a long, long time. David, we've talked to you about UFO abductions. Do you have any particular yeah. observations about Calvin Parker and Charles Hickson? Well, I have to tell you that on the one hand, I don't think the abduction can have taken place as they described. It. That the pier off which they were fishing was fairly close to a major highway. And it's inconceivable to me that none of the motorists reported seeing the object that abducted them land or take off. On the other hand, I cannot believe that they simply fabricated it as a joke. That what seems to me to prove that they didn't is the police tapes. Did, did you talk about that with uh, Calvin when he was on the show? The secret yeah. tapes, the police tapes, yes. Yes, yes. I mean, it's clear that these are two people who've been through an experience which they found harrowing, which they don't understand. So I think we have to keep both of those realities in balance, that they did experience something, and what they experienced was not what they thought it was. How would you interpret it then? Okay, I'm going to use a category here, but once I say that, I don't think I've given much of an explanation for it, and that is to call it a religious vision. There are some curious features of it. One is that they describe the ship that comes for them as having, that I think it's opening is like is like a fish's mouth, which means which seems to me significant in that they went out to catch fish, so that the ones who were catching are themselves caught. Another thing that I found striking about it is that Hickson says to Parker at one point, "They they had a son." They could have owned us. And I found myself thinking how curious it is that these are people from a part of the country where not long before people did own other people. And which in 1973, the legacy of that was still a matter of struggle and conflict. And I expect that all of these things were expressed in their experience. Now, exactly how that worked, I do not know. 
we have a number of parallels that might help understand how this kind of thing can happen. Well, it certainly is coincidental that, uh, and that exactly, you couldn't have said it better. The idea that they were out fishing and they themselves were caught in a large fish-shaped UFO, I mean, you can't escape that. Yeah. So what are these other parallels then that, that sort of suggest to you that, that we might be able to get a little closer to some sort of an explanation? Okay, I find myself thinking of I find myself thinking of a book by a man named Morton Schatzman called The Story of Ruth. Now Schatzman was an American psychiatrist who was practicing in London. And one of his patients was a young American woman, also in London, who was troubled, not to say tormented, by apparitions, appearances of her father, who would come and harass her. Now, in fact, this was a man who had abused her sexually when she was a child. And he would come and insult her and generally make her life miserable, even though he was physically on the other side of the Atlantic. Am I making, am I making myself clear so far? Yes. That she saw appar an apparition of him coming and troubling her. Do you mean and like a doppelganger of some type? Like a physical observation as if you were visually observing someone? Absolutely. And she saw when she was in Schatzman's office during the therapy hour, the apparition would come to her. And Schatzman couldn't see it, but she couldn't see him. But uh, Ruth, as he called the woman, could see him. Not only that, she could stretch out her hand and touch him. That she could touch her father's beard and then compare it to Schatzman and, and say that the one is smoother than the other. So Schatzman, Schatzman was really puzzled by this, and he decided to do something that I find very interesting. That instead of treating this as a pathological symptom, to say, okay, she's crazy, she's hallucinating, she's seeing things, to say, what if what she's experiencing is something that maybe we all have potential for, but we haven't developed it? In other words, that this ability to create an apparition is a talent that some people have. And he worked with her to try to develop the talent and to try to increase her control so she could get rid of her father's apparition, which was hostile and menacing, and create other apparitions that were more to her taste, such as when her husband went off on a business trip, she created an apparition of her husband with whom she went on to have blowout sex. Now, exactly how this works remains mysterious. But it looks like some people have the ability to do this, have the ability to create in their minds and interact with beings that nobody else can see, but which are real, are very real to them. Let's continue with this in our next segment. We have David Halperin, longtime UFO investigator and religious scholar. We have Jay Randall Murphy as our co-host, as a matter of fact. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in The Purecast. We also have swag. You know, we have all these exclusive Paracast things that you can buy 
We've got like, I guess, 60 or so different items and entails T-shirts, sleeves for notebook computers, iPad cases, mouse pads, the Paracast Jumbo tote bag, all sorts of T-shirts and jackets and stuff like that for men and women. We have a Paracast aluminum water bottle. All this stuff, you go to store.theparacast.com, store.theparacast.com. What makes it special is that the items are the best quality, you know, great T-shirts, fabrics, and they have our official logo on them. That's what makes them special in multiple sizes and colors. We even have stuff for children, stuff for women, stuff for men. We have all sorts of sizes, like small up to X large. A lot of good stuff. That's the swag from the Paracast. If you go to store.theparacast.com, stop by and take a shopping tour. Let's talk tough. Let's talk comfort. Let's talk about down-home value. Made in the USA blue jeans, like you wore as a kid. Remember? There's a place down in Tennessee Where they make blue diamond gusset jeans They so pride in every stitch Guarantee you love the way they fit They put a diamond gusset in the crotch Where you need it most Blue diamond gussets got it Others don't For good old-fashioned comfort, get diamond gusset jeans Every stitch guaranteed And our Defender motorcycle jean comes Kevlar reinforced See them at GUSSET.com That's gusset.com Or call 888-848-7738 That's 888-848-7738 Diamond gusset jeans got it Others don't Hi, I'm Marcia Miller from Mud Pie. Every new parent dreams of bringing their baby home for the first time. But some babies are born too sick or too soon to come home right away. That's why Mud Pie supports the life-saving research and programs of the March of Dimes, the leading nonprofit organization for pregnancy and baby health. Help us give every baby a fighting chance so that more babies can come home healthy. Learn how at marchofdimes.org. For over five years, you've been hearing about the Berkey guy, so you may know a few things about him. For example, you are well aware of the superior quality and effectiveness of Berkey water filters and accessories. But did you know the Berkeys have had independent lab tests done to prove just how effective they are? It's true, and he can email you the test results. Just visit GoBerkey.com. You may also know that the Berkey guy has helped tens of thousands of people get better prepared. Now here's something you may not know. GoBerkey.com has amazing specials and deals all the time on a wide variety of survival and preparedness products. Most ready to ship same day. Visit the Berkey guy at GoBerkey.com and be sure to click the red Products on Sale Now button. You can always call toll-free 877-886-3653. Again, that's 877-886-3653. GoBerkey.com, home of the Berkey guy. Are you afraid to go to the mailbox because of letter after letter from the IRS? Are they stacking on more and more penalties and interest? By now, you know the problem won't go away on its own. Don't let the IRS chase you to your grave with penalties and interest and liens and levies. You need real help now. I'm Dan Pilla. I wrote the book on tax debt settlement, and I helped thousands of people solve tax problems they thought couldn't be solved. I can help you too. Call 800-34-NO-TAX or go to my website, danpilla.com. That's danpilla.com, danpilla.com. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Oh, by the way, David, it looks like Randall is suffering from echoism. What do we do about that? I don't know. I understand there's a pill for that, and there's also an app for that. Anyway, we're talking here about these experiences. So the question is here, we have an older man in his 40s, I guess, at the time, Charles Hickson. We have a 19-year-old young man, Calvin Parker. And the question is here, did they separately bring this upon themselves? Did one influence the other? What do you think? I don't know. What we do know, though, is that the mind is a very powerful pattern 
recognition machine and generator, and that people can have these sorts of visions that you described previously. I think the clinical term, at least for one of them, is a hypnopompic hallucination. But that doesn't mean we have to treat it as a disease. And the approach that the therapist you mentioned took, I think, would have been a very beneficial way to explore the phenomena. Yeah, I would use the word hallucination, except there seems to be no way to scrub it of its negative connotation. So when you see that you hear the word hallucination, you think of somebody staggering around drunk and seeing pink elephants or six feet tall white rabbits or whatever. Whereas we seem to be dealing, and this is the case of Ruth and Morton Schatzman is one that's been particularly well explored, but it seems to be a fairly common phenomenon that people who are perfectly sane, who are not under the influence, of any chemical substance, see these things and sometimes interact with them. I remember a librarian whom I'm from Western North Carolina, whom I met several years ago, a very charming woman in her 50s, though she looked younger and very intelligent. And she was talking to me about the UFO aliens she saw on her lawn through the windows of her house when she was a child. And she said to me, I know they weren't really there, but I did see them. And I want to hold on to both halves of her statement. I believe both of them. They weren't really there. And yes, she did really see them. Well, that's entirely possible. Our, uh, I've brought up the work of Michael Persinger on recent shows. Are you aware of who he is? Yes. So you know then that he can actually induce experiences like that in people through the right frequencies of EM, electromagnetic stimulation of uh, people's he, brains. And if I understand correctly, he's tried to associate UFO sightings with geographical areas where there are those levels of stimulation. Absolutely. And uh, other people have also, including him, have connected it with other forms of EM, not simply, say, geomagnetic, but things like plasma phenomena, possibly ball lightning. So one of the things we we asked Calvin is if something like ball lightning, which is a, a bright blue light, which is what they describe seeing, could have triggered this type of an experience in them. And then as the effect wore off, they were just left in standing in place where they were. And he didn't deny that that could be possible. And that was one of the other reasons that I do, like you, believe that he really did have a genuine experience of some kind. Yeah. And I think that one of the factors going into it, and the one that I stressed when he, I quoted Hickson, that they could have owned us, I think it's this country's very painful racial history. Remember that the abduction tradition starts out with a mixed race couple, Betty and Barney Hill. And Barney is absolutely terrified by his experience. Now, if I ask, How did Barney's ancestors come to this country? The most reasonable answer is that they were abducted in the middle of the night and taken to an alien ship. And I think that is what is being repeated in the experience that came up for Barney under hypnosis. That's really interesting. But then isn't sometimes a potato just a potato? I mean, in other words, putting that into a paranormal context, I have an Irish heritage. But when I look at a potato, I don't suddenly envision myself as a reincarnated Irish immigrant who died during the Great Potato Famine or survived the Titanic. And likewise, the UFO I saw didn't look like a fairy mound or an apparition of the Blessed Virgin Mary or St. Patty or a leprechaun. And nor did I have any sudden epigenetic compulsion to be taken aboard the UFO to escape the trauma brought on by Nina signs and other hibernophobia. But were your ancestors actually taken aboard a ship? 
against their will. Well, well they, there's no question that they suffered all the trauma and, of the Irish and set about on the sea to come to a new land on a ship. And so, you know, on ships at the time, mainly. Yet I don't see that sort of a thing. I mean, I have seen a UFO. It, it didn't remind me of any of that. But I don't know that it's a strong argu- an argument against it that it doesn't occur everywhere. What I find really interesting about your interpretations are these symbolisms from history and culture and mythology. I actually find them really fascinating. So maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit more about some other examples. This is going to be not, uh, not going back into uh, deep mythology or anything. But I'll give you the case of the Belgian sighting from the end of November 1989 into the spring of 1990. Right, the triangle Uh, craft. Exactly. And I'm going to be dependent here on uh, Eric Wellett, who has written about these. I wish this idea were mine, but it's not original with me. It's Eric's. We did have, in the end of 1989 and early 1990, repeated sightings over Belgium. Oddly, they did not seem to spread beyond the borders of Belgium. Different types of UFOs, but the standard kind was the triangular UFO, three bright white lights, and in the middle, a dimmer red light. When these things were photographed, what came out on in the picture was either a blob or nothing at all. So I think it's fair to assume that people were not seeing tangible, physical, photographable things in the sky. So what were they seeing? Well, keep in mind that that November 1989 was a pretty eventful time in European history. The Berlin Wall had come down on November 9th. This was an emblem of what you could see going on around you, that communism was crumbling, generally without violence, in Eastern and Central Europe. Let's break here. More to come with David Halpern. With Gene and Randall, you're in The Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. It's a no-brainer. A Big Berkey water filter is the one you need, period. You need a water filter that removes chlorine, fluoride, pharmaceuticals, BPA, and other endocrine disruptors, pesticides, bacteria, viruses, and much more, right? And does it all at only two cents per gallon. Get the original and most trusted name in gravity water filtration, Big Berkey. And now GCN listeners receive 5% off ceramic filter systems using code GCN. Call or click 1-877-99-BERKEY or BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. That's 1-877-99-BERKEY. Most of you know that heart disease is the number one silent killer in the U.S. What if I told you for just $54.95 a month you could fight against heart disease naturally? At Heart and Body Extract, we've been helping thousands of people get back to a healthier heart. Don't just take my word for it. Check out all of the success stories at hbextract.com. Or to order, call 866-295-5305. That's 866-295-5305. hbextract.com. Don't risk it when you can take charge of it. For USA Radio News, I'm Wendy King. Former President Barack Obama is hitting the campaign trail again, not for himself, but for fellow Democrats. He's given a speech in Orange County, California, urging Democrats to get registered and vote in the November election. He gave the crowd a pep talk. Are you ready to get to work? Are you ready to get to work? Mr. Obama appeared alongside seven Democrats in California who are trying to win House seats currently held by Republicans. I am absolutely confident these candidates are going to win. And if these candidates win, I am absolutely confident that Washington will start working better. Vice President Mike Pence says he's disappointed to see Obama campaigning because he says Americans rejected his policies in the 2016 election. You're listening to USA Radio News. 
Back pain doesn't take vacations. It never celebrates holidays. It's on the job 24-7 to keep your life exactly where it is, in limbo. But it doesn't have to be that way because Laser Spine Institute can help you take back your life from chronic neck and back pain. With a less than one inch incision, our minimally invasive procedures have provided relief to over 60,000 patients with a 97% patient satisfaction rate. So get ready to stand tall and live the life you've imagined for yourself without pain. Are you or a loved one suffering from a bulging disc, herniated disc, spinal stenosis, pinched nerve, or degenerative disc disease? Call our spine care consultants now for a no-cost MRI review and to learn more. It's time to say goodbye to chronic neck and back pain. What have you got to lose? Laser Spine Institute, the leader in minimally invasive spine surgery. 844-972-BACK. 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 That's 844-972-BACK. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-318-4349 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-318-4349. Again, that's 800-318-4349. This is Jacques Vallée. You're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. David Halpern, please continue on your discussion about these influences. So what people were seeing is, on the one hand, a classic Jungian quaternity, that is, a combination of four, of which three are identical, and then the fourth is somehow different. Three bright white lights and a dimmer red light, and a symbolization of what's going on around them, that the red star is a symbol of communism. The white star was and is a symbol of NATO, which had and has its headquarters in Brussels. I don't think there's too much more to say about Belgium, except you can always say it's a coincidence. And this is what I am continually running up against. Maybe it is all coincidental. So, A little too coincidental. I mean... We can get into religious symbolism there as well. We've got three bright white lights. Uh, does that remind you of anything? The Trinity, perhaps, surrounding the evil red symbolism of the, the demons and so on? Yes, Dr. Jung, please call your office. Yes, that what Jung set forth these ideas in an essay on the psychological basis of the concept of the Trinity, that the Trinity for him is a mutilated quaternity, and Christianity suffers from the suppression of that fourth, who is, as you suggest, the devil, or alternatively, the female. I mean, I think that there is that, let's call it a universal symbol, but then also a very specific symbol of a very specific historical process, the crumbling of European communism. This also feels very medieval. Right, which is also he, seen as evil, right? The, con, the evil communists. It all translates yeah. almost perfectly. What I meant by medieval, though, is that people in the Middle Ages, when they know that they, they, they have a sense of something happening around them, they look up at the sky and they see, I don't know, globes fighting each other or armies in the sky that they project into the sky their awareness of what's going on around them. 
I think that's what happened in what's always happening in Belgium. And I would raise the question, are those UFOs real or not? They're not real in the sense of they're not machines flying around up there. This is where we can get into something really cool and interesting a little yeah. further down in the discussion here. But let's just go with that for now. And, and so that people can get an idea on how you're looking at this, because I do find it quite fascinating, especially if we are also dealing with some form of an alien intelligence that's studying us. Now, that makes it more complicated. And Jung himself waffled on that. And I would take the more, what would you say, absolutist position that we are not dealing with an alien intelligence. I mean, I can't help think of but think of what Eddie Bullard said at one point, and he said this actually in an email to me, that if we are indeed being visited by beings from outer space, they are for the most part innocent bystanders to our psychic dramas. And I think that's a very, a very fine way of putting it, but I also don't think it's true. I think we can do with the psychic dramas and dispense with the visitors, who seem to me very problematic. I can certainly agree that the UFO phenomena is seen through the lens of our world views. But in your case, that involves so much philosophical and psychological filtering that I worry you've gone off the edge into subjective idealism, which is not only ontologically unfalsifiable, but epistemologically nonsensical. Okay, now you've got to unpack that for me. Okay. <laughs> okay. There's no question that we interpret our experiences through the lens of our worldviews. I think that right. part that part we've got. So in your case, your worldview is very much composed of philosophical and psychological filtering because of your education and your study of the phenomena in that context. So much so that you seem to be of the opinion that we're not dealing with actual physical objective realities, but a purely mental phenomena, which is why I say subjective idealism, which is the philosophical position that holds that everything we experience is purely some sort of mental construct. And of I course, that's that at all. Right, but it, that's why I say I worry about that, so that's why I was trying to clarify. I mean, I don't believe that, every, that, that everything in the world we see around us is, our, is our, our mental construct. I mean, I look out the window of my house, I see a tree, I see leaves. If I were to photograph that tree, it would be there on, I assume, it would be there on the photograph. But now here we're dealing with the edges. We're dealing with things that people see that don't seem to be photographable, that don't seem to have a physical reality, and which nonetheless they do see. As that librarian saw those, those UFO aliens standing on her lawn. And I have to invoke something like what on, went on with Morton Schatzman's patient that they are seeing something that comes from within them. Great, as a subjective experience. However, because the librarian didn't have a camera and wasn't able to take a picture, we can't assume that they weren't really there. One thing we can assume in most cases, however, that people's optical perceptions are the result of a stimulus response, which is well understood scientifically to be the result of objectively real photons from outside our immediate physical reality entering into it and turning into images within our mind. Yeah, most of the time what we do experience is about things that are there, not about things that aren't there. So why should we assume that with so many sightings that all these people are having some sort of purely subjective experience? Well, so many sightings, but it's still a tiny fraction of all the optical experiences that people have. I mean, let's talk about the sun. I don't know if the sun is shining where you are. It is here. You go outside, you look at the sun. You probably, you probably shouldn't do that. You probably should look away. 
Uh, there's no question that if you photograph it, it's up there. Uh, and millions, billions of other people will be having the same experience in this 24-hour period. Now, on one October day in 1917, something like 70,000 people watched that sun fall to the earth at Fatima in Portugal. These included professors, journalists, totally respectable, totally sober people who saw together the sun do something that the sun cannot possibly do. There's the fringe. There's where we have to say there's a phenomenon that is coming from the inside, perhaps mingling with the outside that they that they did see the sun, but then they saw it do something impossible. Right, but that could be explainable in fairly reasonable technological terms if you allow for it. So perhaps it's simply their, like we were saying before, it's their worldviews. So if, okay, so let's say, for example, we have, suppose for the sake of argument, that there are motherships. And let's suppose for argument that they have smaller craft. There isn't any reason why a mothership might not be able to block out the sun and send out another craft that ascends or descends down to the earth. This is a question we could pursue in our next segment. Randall, Gene, David, you're in the Paracast. <laughs> Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Do you need a website? Well, you can get a great deal on hosting services with Namecheap's legendary coupon code. They're offering substantial hosting discounts on shared hosting, business hosting, VPS hosting, reseller hosting, and even dedicated servers. Namecheap is preferred by millions. It's backed by a money-back guarantee. Use the coupon code LEGENDARY to cash in on the special deal at Namecheap.com, Namecheap.com. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. Healthcare reform is confusing. With the loss of the Obamacare mandate, those needing help can now choose an affordable alternative. By joining Liberty HealthShare, you're part of a community of health-conscious Americans all over the country who control their own healthcare costs and choices. Liberty HealthShare is not insurance. It is an association of self-pay patients who unite with like-minded people to share the cost of their medical needs. Neighbor helping neighbor. Learn more now by going to libertyoncall.org. That's libertyoncall.org. Hunters, anglers, campers, and survivalists. Get back to nature. Expand your horizons with the highest quality, most versatile, unique slingshots and sling bows on the market at slingbow.com. Slingbow products are compact and models start from just $17.98. They're perfect for your bug out bag or storing in your vehicle. Give yourself and your loved ones the excitement and tradition of Slingbow. A new frontier in archery and truly modern twist on this primitive survival tool. Feel the thrill only at slingbow.com. Water is the single most important thing your body needs, so you want to be sure it's the best for you and your family. Since 2005, thousands have depended on Berkey Purified Water. The Berkey Guy provides the lowest priced filtration systems in every size. For incredibly delicious water now and in an emergency, get to GoBerkey.com or call 877-886-3653, 877-886-3653. GoBerkey.com. 
Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, the inventor of my pillow. And like all of you out there, I had problems sleeping. Pillows would go flat. I would flip flop all night long. I would wake up with a sore neck, maybe a headache, or feel like I needed a nap, even though I slept eight hours. When I invented my pillow, I wanted it to where you could move the patented fill to give you the exact support you need as an individual, regardless of sleep position. My pillow will get you into that deep REM sleep faster, and you will stay there longer. It's not about how much time we spend in bed; it's about how much of that quality sleep we get. I do all of my own manufacturing right here in the United States. I have a 10-year warranty. You can wash and dry my pillow, and I give you a 60-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to lose. And here's my best offer ever. You can buy one of my pillows and get one absolutely free. Go to MyPillow.com or call 800-870-0305 and use promo code GCN. That's MyPillow.com or 800-870-0305 with promo code GCN. Bacon lovers, we ship free. Try our amazing bacon. No refrigeration required. Proprietary value-added packaging provides 10-year shelf life and protects the leanest, thickest, center-cut, fully-cooked bacon in America today. Ready to eat right from the pouch or warm and serve. Savory and delicious. Wholesale price for your everyday use. Order today at readytoeatbacon.com. Readytoeatbacon.com. Hi, this is James Fox from Chasing UFOs. You're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. So we're talking about the way of interpreting the UFO sighting, Randall. Would you go on, please? Right. So uh, all I was saying is that you know, there is, okay, there is one way we could interpret it. If other reports of giant mother craft are accurate, then this is a way that that could hypothetically be explained by a type of technology that's more advanced than ours. Maybe then we need to confront the issue of my basic skepticism. Why do I rule that out? I mean, if so, if you go to Australia and you come back with a report of a hopping pouched animal, the simplest explanation is that it was really there. You really saw it because we accept the existence of kangaroos. Why do I not accept the, the existence of mother ships and smaller ships? I would give two answers, of which the one I think is, real, is the one that really moved me. And I don't know if Gene has talked at all about my, you know, he and I have known each other now, Lord Gene, how long has it been? 53 years, 54 years? That's close enough for jazz, yes. Uh, yeah, that, so we, 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 we've been around for a long time. And Gene knows that I was a convinced believer in the extraterrestrial hypothesis, that we were being visited by beings from outer space. And in those days, we used to make fairly confident predictions about the impact that this would have on human history. I mean, in the very first UFO book, Donald Kehoe's The Flying Saucers Are Real, he describes going or traveling on a plane and thinking that the lives of everyone on that plane would be affected by the flying saucers. That was 1950. I would guess that nearly everyone on that plane is dead now, and not one has experienced the slightest impact of the flying saucers. If these things were in our skies, they have had no influence whatsoever on the course of history. Oh, I, I think we could disagree there, that's for sure. Um, okay, so let's do, let's do that. Well, for starters, uh, UFOs have been an inspiration for a number of NASA engineers who continue to be the inspiration for people to want to find out what they are and explore topics like anti-gravity and exotic propulsion and exploring the cosmos themselves. That's been admitted by people in the, in the business. And it goes way back, back to, back to Paul R. Hill, who saw a, a UFO himself and dedicated much of his thought and time to trying to figure out how to engineer them. They've eked into every corner of our culture 
from entertainment to advertising to books to novels to TV films. To say that there is no impact on our culture is just just simply so much evidence to the contrary (laughs) that uh, it's, I'm sorry, I find it laughable. And now we're back. Well, now we're back on the same page, actually, because I couldn't agree with you more that the belief in UFOs, the image of the UFO, the idea of the UFO, has had an enormous impact. But extraterrestrial visitors themselves, I would say zero. There has been no contact. There has been no invasion. The stale old question of why they don't land on the White House lawn remains intact. Right. So you're talking about some sort of verifiable material, scientifically valid evidence, as opposed to observation by thousands of people. Which is still a fraction of the total number of observations of sun, moon, birds, etc. that people have. But right. well, I, I mean, I, I, when I was a kid, I, I, I in high school, I did what I thought was a really rather clever uh, cartoon showing two Indians going out to standing, um, Native Americans standing on a wooded promontory over an ocean, and there you see three boats out there, Nina, Pinta, and Santa Maria, and one of the Native Americans says to the other, "You brought me all the way out here to look at temperature inversions." <laughs> but where that breaks down is that's beautiful. That the Native Americans very soon felt the impact of the visitors in dreadful and unmistakable ways. We have not. Right. But that's maybe not their intent either. We don't know what their intent is, assuming that they exist, which um, you're on the other side of the fence from me there. Absolutely. So, uh, I, and I think both sides of the fence tend to have some pretty good points to make, and that's what's making this such a fascinating conversation. Well, your side of the fence is shared, among others, by Jerome Clark, who is one, one of the most profoundly intellectual people I know, and who is now, I, I'm going to insert a plug here that the, his monumental UFO encyclopedia is about to appear in its third edition. There's no question that people on your side of the fence have a strong case, but I cannot accept it. And the answer that you give, well, we know that, that we don't know what their purpose is, is the answer I always used to give. You know, we we can't say, you know, what would we do if we were if uh, if we, if uh, we were in their place, because we don't know what their place is. It was only afterwards that I realized, many years afterwards, that I realized that once I've said that, then the extraterrestrial hypothesis loses its explanatory power. Because there's nothing that can be postulated of extraterrestrial visitors. Well, I, I think there's things that can be postulated but whether or not it can be proven is another story. And, and then, of course, then we get into the issue of proof and what exactly that means and the nature of evidence and what we accept as evidence that is good enough for proof. Yeah. And sh- shall I confess what I think is the weakest part of my case right now? But that, doesn't make, it, that doesn't make it less fascinating, though, because uh, and. I think we can speculate on this a little bit more as we go, uh, that from my side of the fence, the kind of effects that you're describing on people's worldviews might be just the kind of thing that they're studying, and that the way that they present themselves might be intentional. In other words, they may be aware of our symbolism and our psychology and present themselves in such a way as to study the effects of their appearance on that. I can't say it's impossible. If one reflects on that, it becomes very, very interesting. Yeah. That there, that there is then this kind of, what would you call it, symb- is symbiosis the word, or is it uh, 
there's another word I'm sort of going for, and I don't, I'm not quite getting it. Uh, what is it? What, what is the one plus one plus one equals three? The synergy. Uh, synergy. Uh, yeah, that's the word right. I'm after. You know, I'm thinking if we were to use an analogy, we could say, you know, go back to the cargo cults who and then who saw the aircraft and started making, you know, what they were. They started making uh, effigies of the of the aircraft and worshiping them. And they believed that the aircraft were themselves living creatures that were being controlled by other human beings. And if we had wanted to. We could have played on that psychology with our airplanes and ourselves to manipulate their culture into believing and thinking certain things. Now, we know from the likes of, say, John Alexander, that psychological warfare uses exactly these kinds of tactics in order to study the possibilities of the whatever terrain and inhabitants that are where they want to be. So why should we assume that uh, another race that is equally intelligent or more so than us wouldn't want to do the same? I think the question then becomes, who gets to ask the question? You can ask me, why shouldn't we assume it? I can ask you, why should we assume it? Why should we not assume that we're dealing with purely human processes, many of them poorly understood or not understood at all. I think you're right. I think in some cases we are dealing with purely human influences. Speaking of human influences, we've got several minutes of those coming up. We'll be back with David Halperin and J. Randall Murphy. You're in the Paracast. listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a thrill a minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors. Classic science fiction at its best. Available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R O C K O I D S dot com. Have you checked your Google search results lately? Search results are usually the first impression that people form of you or your business. So make sure that they create a positive impression with ReputationDefender.com. What the Internet says about you can have a big impact on your life and your livelihood, even if it's not true. Fortunately, you can now control how you look online and in online search results with ReputationDefender.com. Call 800-831-0771 now. That's 800-831-0771 for your free reputation analysis. If you have negative material from an ex-employee, upset patient, or former client, newspaper article, legal issue, social media, or other source showing up in your search results, you can combat it with ReputationDefender.com. Our dedicated experts in patented technology can help make your online search results look their best. Call 800-831-0771 to learn more. 800-831-0771. That's 800-831-0771. Or visit ReputationDefender.com. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. So, what is meant here by human influences, Randall? That's a good question for David. Because 
Uh, I think he's the one who, you're the one, David, who is suggesting that in, well, I, I think you're suggesting in all cases that there are no objectively real aliens. This is something that comes from within the human psyche and is projected out into a, a subjective reality for the experiencer. Yes, and as I've sometimes said, from from inside of the human mind, which has enough alienness to fill a universe. I think there's no question about that, especially when we look at some of the wonderful science fiction that's been written over the years. So I, 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 I think that the UFOs become both more understandable and, in my own view, more fascinating as a purely human phenomenon. And more fascinating, perhaps, because then they become comprehensible and not just enigmas far away in the sky. Right. Maybe that's what you're looking for, though. You, you need that sort of comprehension because you're an, an academic and a thinker and you need closure and resolution to this problem. And it's one way in your mind to get that. Whereas if you don't go that route, you don't really have an answer. I keep thinking of the, of, the, of the saying that when the only tool you've got is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Right. And there's, there's certainly, certainly that, that danger. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think that that's, a, uh, that's prevalent in the field. And we need to be careful not to overly reinforce that. Yeah, I guess, I guess overly reinforce it, but I don't know how you measure the overly. I actually think there's a merit to going as far out on a limb as you can and to present your position in as pure a form as you can to see where its limitations are. Oh, sure. Yeah. I actually feel that that's very much what you're doing with the way that you're looking at it. And it's a fairly unique position, and it's certainly one worth considering. I, in the beginning of my, uh, my the, the book that I'm writing now, which is going to be published by Stanford University Press called Intimate Alien, The Hidden Story of the UFO, I claim for myself that I'm advocating a third way. I don't believe in UFOs, and I don't debunk UFOs. This is a third approach that I think acknowledges the essential point that UFOs are something enormously important, not bunk by any man in any sense of the word, and yet that they are not real physically. Well, how about a fourth approach that combines all of it? Why couldn't there be, say, an alien presence that makes itself known through deception? In other words, I've, if you've got the technology to make your craft look and behave like whatever you want it to be, especially the cultural stereotypes of the civilization you're presenting yourself to, then you're portraying something that isn't real to them and yet has an objective reality behind the facade. And would you use that to explain the anomaly that the 1897 airships were just one step ahead of the technology of their time? It could. It could explain that quite easily. Yeah. yeah. But then again, there are other explanations. We know that newspapers simply fabricated stories. We know that the psyche of the time was that was the forward thinking people are going to become aeronauts type of thing. But if you get in, if you believe that the, say, really weird cases were actual cases, then there really isn't much other way to explain them other than some sort of alien technology. Now, I don't mean by alien that they necessarily come from another star system. They might be interstellar. They might not be. I don't have the answer to that. 
I'm just saying it comes from beyond the boundaries and constructs of our known civilization. But they do have a certain tendency to introduce themselves as American inventors with a very strange tendency to be named Wilson. <laughs> oh? Yeah, Jerry Clark has written on this, that, the na- that, well, that people do claim to have met the pilot of the, uh, uh, of the airship and that they announced that they've invented this, they're Americans, and that it will be revealed to the public soon, which it never, never is. And the name Wilson keeps cropping up. Jerry Clark brought forward a really interesting case, and this this uh, intrigues me in my other hat as a as a uh, as a Jewish historian. Of what one of the witnesses was a rabbi in Beaumont, Texas, who learned that a uh, the airship had landed at a nearby farm and went out to see it, and shook met and shook hands with the inventors. Now. I keep thinking, why is he telling this story? What is the reality behind it? I mean, uh, you can, it's the same sort of question you can ask about uh, uh, about Hickson and Parker. What is the reality behind it? The only the, the main answer I can give is what it might have functioned, how it might have functioned for him. Here is a man who's trained in Germany, the European. In Beaumont, Texas, he's an alien, both as a foreigner and as a Jew. And by shaking hands with the pilots of the airship, he becomes part of the American, great American march of progress. You see what I'm saying? I do. It's wonderful. I absolutely love it. So what? And, and 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 okay. So here's my question. Now, suppose we were to go back. Uh, do, uh, this is impossible. It's completely impossible. But suppose we were to get into the to. Uh, I think his name was Levy. Rabbi Levy's mind. What? What would he? What did he do? What did he see? What did I he don't... experience? And how much did he invent? I don't know. <laughs> so you know, I think I, I'd be I'd be inclined to say he made the whole darn thing up, but then I I think of of Ruth in her therapist's office watching her father standing menacingly over her. Right. So well, why in some yeah, why couldn't Rabbi Levy have gone out to a farm and seen the, the, these aeronauts? Had a yeah, had a waking dream and just sure it's it's possible. Um, I'm just saying that that doesn't rule out other possibilities in other cases as well, right? So, you know, just painting the entire phenomena with one brush just seems to be going a little too far for me. Yeah, yeah. I can see your objection. I think, at least procedurally, it works best for me to start out doing that. Yeah, I see more where you're coming from now. It's like, okay, well... Let's just ask the question, could this explain that particular case? And that's a perfectly reasonable way to go about looking at the problem or the question itself. Now, Um, folks, we're going to break in a moment. Now, isn't it also an important point here to not just ascribe this to one explanation? I think that's one of the problems some of us have with the ETH, that... In that particular case, it's got to be spaceships or something conventional, or maybe the, a tad of uh, a touch of conventional aircraft, test aircraft, that sort of thing. We've got David Halpern with J. Randall Murphy. I'm Gene Steinberg. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Neighbors, we've made such a deal with HelloFresh, and it means that everyone listening to this show can receive $30 off your first week of deliveries when you go to HelloFresh.com and use the offer code PARACAST30. You know, with HelloFresh, you can choose the delivery day that works best for you. They've got a wide variety of chef-curated recipes that change weekly. And can you imagine me cooking 
Japanese panko chicken. It makes me feel like I'm a chef. It means also that you could actually get your meal cooked in 30 minutes. For busy people, this is perfect. The simple recipes include step-by-step instructions so even I can figure it out. Go to HelloFresh.com, use the offer code PARACAST30 to get $30 off your first week of deliveries. HelloFresh.com. Let's talk tough. Let's talk comfort. Let's talk about down-home value. Made in the USA blue jeans like you wore as a kid. Remember, there's a place down in Tennessee where they make blue diamond gusset jeans. They so pride in every stitch. Guarantee you love the way they fit. They put a diamond gusset in the crotch where you need it most. Blue diamond gussets got it. Others don't. For good old fashioned comfort, get diamond gusset jeans. Every stitch guaranteed. In our Defender motorcycle jean comes Kevlar reinforced. See them at GUSSET.com. That's gusset.com. Or call 888 848 7738. That's 888 848 7738. Diamond gusset jeans got it. Others don't. Hunters, anglers, campers, and survivalists. Get back to nature. Expand your horizons with the highest quality, most versatile, unique slingshots and sling bows on the market at slingbow.com. Slingbow products are compact and models start from just $17.98. They're perfect for your bug out bag or storing in your vehicle. Give yourself and your loved ones the excitement and tradition of Slingbow. A new frontier in archery and truly modern twist on this primitive survival tool. Feel the thrill only at slingbow.com. If you owe money to the IRS, you need to hear this. The IRS is cracking down on those who owe back taxes. It starts with a devastating letter. And if you don't act immediately, you could find yourself having your wages garnished or have a lien placed on your property. But there's a solution. Tax 10,000 can help. Avoid enforced compliance, where these holds on your income and seizure of your home could become a nightmare that just won't end. Call 800-239-9957 now and speak to one of our experts. 800-239-9957 is the number to link you directly to a tax resolution specialist who will negotiate with the IRS on your behalf. Working through the IRS Fresh Start program, all the forms will be handled for you. All you have to do is make the toll-free call. 800-239-9957. Find out if you qualify and possibly save yourself thousands of dollars, not to mention a lot of headaches. It could be the best call you've made today. That number again, 800-239-9957. The service does not provide tax settlement or legal services. We will refer you to a company that does provide such services. Often the IRS will not agree to any reduction in the amount owed. Not all taxpayers who owe more than $10,000 will qualify for a tax reduction program. Looking for that edge during those intimate moments? We see many ads for enhancement, but the side effects include death. At GCN Team, we should change the Healthy Body Brain and Heart Pack to the Healthy Libido Pack. The brain and heart are not the only organs that require a healthy vascular system. For proper blood flow at the right moment, go to GCNTeam.com or call 877-878-4203. That's 877-878-4203. That's 877-878-4203. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. Now, we kind of touched on this, David, and maybe I want to move to it, because frankly, I expected to talk about something else like dreams, but you never know. And that is this book you're working on that's going to be published, what, two years from now? Can you give us kind of a preview of what we're looking for? Yeah, it's really a setting forth of the kind of the approach that I've been talking about here. First of all, a third way to neither, neither belief nor debunking. And secondly, and here we have to start bringing Jung in, that to see UFOs as a myth, but myths as real and important. In the pursuit of that path, I start out with my own autobiography as a uh, at Confessions of a Teenage Ufologist and ask, what did UFOs mean to me? Since I think actually the essential question to be asked about the UFOs is, what do they mean? 
and then to move from there toward what they mean to others. That I try to demonstrate my idea of apparitions, of people seeing things that may be triggered by something physically in the sky, and yet which become the nucleus of a religious vision. Then from there I go to one of the main sections of the book, which is the abduction tradition, starting out with Betty and Barney Hill, and the tremendous impact that Whitley Strieber had on it. That on the one hand, you can trace it to its beginnings with the hills. On the other hand, there's a prehistory of it that goes back. You know that whole business with the pretty Annika mask? Uh, no, you tell us about that. That there's a mask from, I think it's about 4000 BCE, from Kosovo, which looks exactly, no, sorry, take that back, not exactly, but enough like the picture on the cover of Strieber's Communion that people who see the two together, I've seen this, there's an intake of breath, and oh, a real startle reaction when they see that. Now, what does this mean? I don't think it's that extraterrestrials landed in prehistoric Kosovo, because the, not only my own bias, but that this mask is part of a sequence of, uh, of uh, artwork, a very, very talented culture that seems to fit perfectly in with their images of some sort of a deity, an animal, a human-faced animal, something. We're not quite sure what the mask is supposed to represent. Uh, but that there is something that Strieber accessed that is very ancient in the human psyche. And that explains, and this is, this is one of the things that fascinates me most about communion, is that people see that cover and have the sense they've seen the same thing. Okay, I've sort of gotten off on that a bit, but that this is that this is one thing that my book talks about, and then I talk about other uh, sort of I would call them collateral subjects related to the UFO, uh, the Men in Black or the Bender Mystery, the Allende Mystery, the traditions of the uh, the the invisible ship. And then, and Gene, I know this is something that you've done really good stuff with, with your interviews, the Shaver mystery, which I see as a, a kind of a dress rehearsal for UFOs. I wanted to bring up a few things based on that. Shaver mystery. Now, when you look at the Shaver mystery, you're seeing in his stories, and of course they were heavily edited by Palmer, although I had the chance of managing to be in contact with Shaver in his final years. So I saw the unedited Shaver. But Palmer wrote pretty traditional pulp fiction stories about an ancient civilization that was very much like all sorts of similar legends. But there was also the indication that a lot of what happened to Shaver, this is what Palmer said, and he told me this, is that Shaver's memory of this a lot of it was in his head. What do you think? I think he's absolutely right, but I don't... Well, he, I don't think he said that, at least, in, in, in your interview. He, well, he said that Shaver said he was, was in the caves for eight years. And Palmer knew that he was in mental hospitals for eight years. Which is true, he was. Well, that really but, plays up with the parallel, then, in the symbolism. And, and that would fit right in with your sort of an explanation, then, wouldn't it, David? Oh, yeah. Yeah, especially since what we've got in the Shaver mystery is the alien from within. Right. And, and Palmer didn't use this to discredit Shaver at all. That he was convinced that Shaver, uh, at least as he's represented in your interview, and you would know this, you were there, that, uh, that Shaver had access to some, some mental realm that was not just his imagination. And it does seem like Shaver 
was tapping into something very, very powerful that got a certain amount of notoriety in the mid-40s, and then uh, a year or two later blossomed in, uh, in the flying saucers. I mean, I, I'm working now on, on the Shaver chapter right now, and I'm stunned at how prophetic Palmer was. Palmer used to say that Shaver predicted the flying saucers. And I think he's right. I think he's right. That, 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 that in, uh, in the July 1946 issue of Amazing Stories, which, was, which actually came out, uh, I, I, I think it was a month earlier. By then, it was, uh, by then Amazing Stories had, uh, had shifted to a, a, a monthly publication. Shaver wrote a, a story called The Cult of the Witch Queen, in which he assumes that spaceships are going back and forth for centuries between the Earth and Venus. And then he writes a footnote and says, well, you may ask, how come nobody ever sees them? And the answer is people do. They're all over Charles Fort. And then Palmer predicts on the basis of this that uh, spaceships are going to be seen. And then, lo and behold, Kenneth Arnold sees them. And people claim to have uh, contact with Venusians. And then Sagan yeah. debunks it all because he becomes an astrobiologist and becomes one of the first people to actually uh, get a read on the actual atmospheric conditions of Venus. Let's get fresh into this in our next segment. But first, we're coming on five years, five fun-filled years of the Paracast Plus. We also offer the After the Paracast podcast. And remember, the main feature is an ad-free version of this show with better quality audio. For more information, go to plus.theparacast.com. Once again, that's plus.theparacast.com for more information. David Halperin, the Shaver Mystery, predicting the arrival of the Flying Saucers. You're in the Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. You haven't experienced yogurt until you've tried a Mossy, embodying health and flavor in a true whole milk, green-fed dairy beverage. Every sip pays homage to our old world cows and the ancient culturing methods their milk benefits from. With over 30 probiotics, a Mossy's undeniably nutritious, refined, cultured sensation bolsters your health and awakens your passion for dairy. A Mossy's so good, and you need to try it. Contact your Longevity distributor or call 877-878-4203 or go to GCNteam.com. Broadcasting to over a 1,000 radio stations, GCN programming is in all of the largest markets. A GCN advertising career could be the business opportunity you've been waiting for. Companies need hardworking representatives just like you to handle their needs, while you earn residual income which can last for years. Companies are buying and they need you. Email advertise at GCNlive.com or call 877-996-4327. That's 877-996-4327. For USA Radio News, I'm Wendy King. President Trump is lashing out over the anonymous New York Times editorial that criticized his leadership. He says he could think of maybe five people that might have written it. People that either I don't like or respect, but they're there because in some cases they have to be governmentally, uh, meaning they're protected. You know, we have a lot of people that are protected. The New York Times has responded to the president in a statement. The editors expressed their confidence that the Justice Department won't participate in such a blatant abuse of government power. The paper says the president's threat underscores not just the need for a free press, but also why the Times must safeguard the author's identity. The president says the Justice Department should investigate who wrote the editorial, saying that people are disgusted that the Times ran the article in the first place. You're listening to USA Radio News. 
This is an urgent health notice for all residents suffering from back, neck, knee, and wrist pain. You may qualify for a pain-relieving brace at little or no cost to you, but the deadline is fast approaching. Simply call the Health Alert Hotline now. You heard right. You may qualify for a pain-relieving back, neck, knee, or wrist brace. These items may even be covered by Medicare or your private insurance. The Health Alert Hotline is your brace company. These specialized braces have been tested for pain relief. Call us toll-free right now to determine your eligibility and to learn how to use your private insurance or Medicare to minimize your out-of-pocket cost. Don't wait. If the deadline passes, you may lose your opportunity to get a pain-relieving back, neck, knee, or wrist brace at little or no cost to you. 800-296-1261. 800-296-1261. 800-296-1261. That's 800-296-1261. Have you checked your Google search results lately? Search results are usually the first impression that people form of you or your business. So make sure that they create a positive impression with ReputationDefender.com. What the Internet says about you can have a big impact on your life and your livelihood, even if it's not true. Fortunately, you can now control how you look online and in online search results with ReputationDefender.com. Call 800-831-0771 now. That's 800-831-0771 for your free reputation analysis. If you have negative material from an ex-employee, upset patient, or former client, newspaper, article, legal issue, social media, or other source showing up in your search results, you can combat it with ReputationDefender.com. Our dedicated experts in patented technology can help make your online search results look their best. Call 800-831-0771 to learn more. 800-831-0771. That's 800-831-0771. Or visit ReputationDefender.com. Hi, this is Don Ecker, and you are tuned into the Paracast. Let me tell you what, you're going to hear stuff here that you probably won't hear anywhere else. Hear that, George Snorri? David, really fascinating when you talk about this at the early days of the UFO field, and Palmer, and Arnold, and Richard S. Shaver. Now, there's a story in a book, I forget the guy's name, Richard Toronto did, on the shaver don't know if you read it where yeah, he points uh, out that sh- that yeah where he points out that shaver was very possibly railroaded by his family into that mental institution well or by his in-laws but yeah i, I mean they didn't like him first of all because he wasn't jewish that uh that he, he married a jewish girl in the uh the, the the detroit art school where he uh where where he studied and also because they thought he was a lunatic that he'd already begun hearing these voices out of his uh, out of his welding gun that he uh, that he wrote about in his stories. And he did go into uh, he was in a couple of mental institutions, one of uh, one of which he was on leave from. And he just when he heard his wife had died and he just uh, fled. And that he used these mental institutions. He he was quite explicit about it that they that they were the equivalent of the underground prison of the the Darrows. Do your do your audience know about Shaver and the Shaver mystery? Oh Darrow yeah, yes we did. We've discussed that a number of times, and we had Richard Toronto on to talk about the Shaver book. My first wife Geneva came on the show because we both knew Shaver. So yes, we did. Yeah. If I could ask a question of you yourself, David, are you religious yourself? Are you a believer in deities? No and yes. I do not believe in God in any conventional sense. By conventional sense, what do you mean? A guarantor of justice and goodness in the world. I'm not going to use the cliche of the long robe and the long white hair and beard because I don't think that's essential. But I think if you are a believer in the biblical God, you have to have some notion, and I think probably of the gods of most religions, that this is the guardian of truth, of justice, who in some way or another enforces ethical standards and i don't believe that that can be similarly i believe that 
the physical world that we know of can be accounted for perfectly well without a God. But I do believe that there are depths of the human unconscious that are beyond what we understand now. And that probably this is, in, this is linked very much with the UFO mystery. So are, 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 do you and believe I, in a creator or like an actual uh, entity other? So, so this is, so in other words, you're sort of on the same page with uh, deities as you are with UFOs, that they're a creation of man's mind. Not quite, because I would ask, what is this unconscious? Well, I mean, Freud advocated for the individual unconscious, even though he, he sensed that there was something larger. He said, we just, we, we, we just shouldn't get into that until we've thoroughly explored the individual unconscious. Jung said, no, we've got to go further. Freud is great as far as he goes, but we need to go further and look for a group unconscious, something that's bigger than the individual unconscious. Now, I sometimes wonder, is it possible there's a third unconscious? Maybe call it the cosmic unconscious, which is as much bigger than the Jungian unconscious as the Jungian is than the Freudian. And that this cosmic unconscious, it may be close. Am I making any sense here? Actually, yes. That's very hard question to ask. That's actually, no, I think you are making a lot of sense if one looks at it the way that I've filtered it through the way that I reason out things, and that is that there very well could be some other entity, say, perhaps if our universe, for example, is a multiverse, and they are able to create universes within universes and ours could be a universe within a universe which means there could be some universe creator out there it doesn't necess necessitate that we deify it but it doesn't preclude the possibility either yeah i i i wouldn't pro i wouldn't preclude it either it's just the uh, the actual deification process that it, if we leave that out then then we sort of get the same thing but we don't we don't have to become devotees, so to speak. And, and perhaps we can agree that religious phenomena are both important and in some sense real, though we may not be able to define in exactly what sense they are real. Mm, right. Well, I've had what would be called an archetypal religious experience. It's pretty powerful, a really interesting story, probably a little bit too much to get into here. But, but another question for you, and I was kind of dying to ask this one, because one of the things that I do as a person with a keen interest in this subject is I look at all, all sides of things. I, of course, I have Young's book, and I have a number of others, and yours sounds like it would make a fantastic addition to any ufology library. But when I get looking at uh, religion, one of the things that I do to try and figure out what they're talking about is to look, try and find an objective reference to what the words mean. And so I got myself a copy of Unger's Bible Dictionary. Now, I don't know if you know who he is, but he, he has a PhD and so on in, in uh, what is it, from the Dallas Theological Seminary. And anyway, he's done a lot of work on trying to figure out what ancient peoples meant by the words that we use today. Have you heard of yeah. him, and are you able to comment on whether I should be using another dictionary, or is that a pretty good I, one? I don't know that one, but I don't. That, that, that says nothing about it. Oh, okay. It may, it may be perfectly, uh, per, perfectly fine. Right. So, for example, uh, when they talk about heaven and the heavens in Scripture, it, he goes back and traces the, the etymology and the evolution of the word and says that the original intent was what we would say today as the sky. And oh, yeah. so, so he's, and he's not talking about like Von Daniken. He's really gone back and done 
you know, some intense study on it at a PhD level. So I think that really helps to try to put some object objectivity in the interpretation. Yeah, to the extent that it can be done. Now, I think it, I think it is very clear that in uh, that in the Bible, at least, at least the Old Testament, heaven. When when uh, the writers speak of the heavens, all they mean is the sky. Right. That yeah. It, and that, that it's not like you, are you going to heaven? Right. The whole sort of la la land thing was created later down the road in history, more as what? Well, I guess I kind of go follow along the lines as a means of uh, behavioral control so that you have the reward of if you follow the the will of the church, you'll be rewarded later with that when you retire to heaven. Let me just throw something out here on the religious question here. And that is, I had a couple of comments and I didn't make a big deal of it because we're going to cover religion from different angles, especially as it may pertain to paranormal events. The feeling here that maybe, Randall, you attacked organized religion or the religious philosophies too much. My point is, you have a right to your opinion. We have a right to be religious, not religious, somewhere in the middle. We have a right to be Christians, Jews, and Muslims, and whatever else there is out there. We have a right to be that way. We have a right to be pagans. We have a right to be Wiccans, if we like to. We got more to come with David, Jean, and Randall. You're in the Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. Do you need a website? Well, you can get a great deal on hosting services with Namecheap's legendary coupon code. They're offering substantial hosting discounts on shared hosting, business hosting, VPS hosting, reseller hosting, and even dedicated servers. Namecheap is preferred by millions. It's backed by a money-back guarantee. Use the coupon code LEGENDARY to cash in on the special deal at Namecheap.com, Namecheap.com. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. Bacon lovers, we ship free. Try our amazing bacon. No refrigeration required. Proprietary value-added packaging provides 10-year shelf life and protects the leanest, thickest, center-cut, fully-cooked bacon in America today. Ready to eat right from the pouch or warm and serve. Savory and delicious. Wholesale price for your everyday use. Order today at readytoeatbacon.com. Readytoeatbacon.com. Hear that? That's the sound of a house being trashed while a gang of thieves ransack the place. And what they don't steal will be destroyed. This year, resolve not to be the next victim of a break-in. Go to faketv.com and discover a device that creates the illusion someone inside is watching TV, even when you're miles away. Security is a mindset, and fake TV should be part of your security solution. Be vigilant, but not fearful. Faketv.com. I'm David Hall, founder of Diamond Gusset, where we're proud of our 100% grown and sewn American-made jeans. Whether you're out for dinner, working on the farm, or on the road, Diamond Gusset Jeans offers a full spectrum of styles and sizes for any occasion. To find yours, visit gusset.com. That's G-U-S-S-E-T.com. Our loyal customers enable us to continue sponsoring Liberty Media outlets like the one you're listening to. In Liberty, David Hall, Diamond Gusset Jean Company. Policies issued by American General Life Insurance Company, Houston, Texas. Not available in all states. For details, visit AIGdirect.com. Do you have a family? Would you like to help make sure they'll be taken care of if anything were to happen to you? If you answered yes, you probably need life insurance. Now, do you think life insurance is expensive? If you answered yes to that, too, you definitely need to give AIG Direct a call. 
We could find you a quarter of a million dollar policy for just $14 a month, which means you could save hundreds of dollars a year. Call us now for a free, no obligation quote. 1 800 919 5435. Since 1995, we've helped millions of people find out if they could save up to 70% on their term life insurance. See how affordably we can help you protect your family. Call AIG Direct now for your free quote. 1 800 919 5435. You could save up to 70%. That's 1 800 919 5435. 1 800 919 5435. It's a no-brainer. A Big Berkey water filter is the one you need, period. You need a water filter that removes chlorine, fluoride, pharmaceuticals, BPA, and other endocrine disruptors, pesticides, bacteria, viruses, and much more, right? And does it all at only two cents per gallon. Get the original and most trusted name in gravity water filtration, Big Berkey. And now GCN listeners receive 5% off ceramic filter systems using code GCN. Call or click 1-877-99-BERKEY or BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. That's 1-877-99-BERKEY. This is Kurt Seven, the author of UFO Mysteries, and you're listening to the Paracast. I want to just go back, just briefly back to the Shaver chapter before we continue, because this sounds like a fascinating book. What do you think about Shaver? Did he actually have a real experience that formed the basis for all the stories he wrote? I think he must have had one that was real to him. I mean, you... Your interview with him produced a story that I haven't seen anywhere else. I don't know if you have, which is that it started with his looking at cloud formation. And I'm wondering whether whether you make anything out of that. I just listened to what he said. I felt he was sincere. I couldn't believe he was a nutcase. I don't see a nutcase there. Maybe I don't know anything. I don't see I don't a nutcase there. I don't know what the word there. nutcase means. Well, I think the implication here is that he's in a mental institution, he's mentally ill, and therefore you can't believe anything he says. But he could have had a genuine internal experience that opened him up to something, and that's no different than a UFO abduction. You 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 quote a, you you quote his story about how he uh, he went on a boat with his friends from the underworld and they entered a cave and that and that, and that, that was how they entered the cave and then the Darrow attacked them and killed everybody except him and then he escaped in his boat and I, ha- I mean I have the sense that he's gone into the realm of the dead and has it's sort of like he's going back across the river Styx. Absolutely. So the, 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 yeah. And if we're going to assume that this, the, the, this mythology of, 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 an, of an underworld, of a, uh, the, the, that you reach by crossing a river, is something that's part of the human psyche, then I don't know why Shaver couldn't have experienced that possibly triggered in some way that never became clear to me by the, by, by the peculiar cloud formation that he saw. Remember here also, when I interviewed Palmer, he said something that he had written about quite a few times. He stayed with Shaver for a few days, and that night he heard voices too. Yep. And he said he heard multiple voices talking over one another, so it couldn't be Shaver doing this. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Because, I mean, we'll here talk. again, if we're, if we're to look at the possibility that there is some sort of an objectively real external influence, we have the technology to make sounds appear in people's minds now. And so why... Couldn't it be possible for some, even us, to study that? I suppose back then it might have been a little too early, but if we have some alien anthropologists wanting to study our reaction, they could certainly do that just to see what's going on in a mental hospital would be a really interesting place to do some of those exact kinds of experiments. So, and you could, and you, you could run it that way, or you could run it the apparition way. 
that Palmer experienced something that might be akin to apparition, that he heard voices that came from inside him. Sure. But then again, I mean, how did they get there? That's the question. I mean, there's, yeah. this, there's that stimulus response again. Uh, yeah. Before before we get too far along here, what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you guys, is we've got a question in our question bank on the forum uh, from a, post, a poster who goes by the name of Farlig Guldstein. And oh boy, wait a minute, wait a minute. What is that name again, sir? <laughs> Farlig Guldstein. <sighs> All right. Yeah, I don't know what that means. <laughs> or if it means something to someone else, I'm just saying that's what's on there. And uh, let's see here. He asks, maybe UFOs are not from space, but how would reports like the following arise solely from the mind? And he cites the 1971 Delphos landing case, the Tehran fighter jet interception, where you have visual and radar. And the Nimitz case more recently, where you've got the flare and uh, plus observation of this Tic Tac UFO. Yeah, uh, those are really good questions. I'll I'll take the the radar visual evidence upsets me less than things like Delphos. Okay, that's a... Because it seems to me that there are numerous cases where things are detected on radar and not seen, including one of the classic cases from the Belgian wave, or where they're seen, but they never appear on radar. So I would be prepared to say that the radar, that, that, that radar visual cases may be a coincidental intersection of false radar returns and some sort of illusion in the sky. Now, what the Delphos, though, is more problematic. And I can think of, offhand, I can think of three cases like that. There's Trans, I think it's Trans en Provence in France, and the one that I know best, which is Socorro, New Mexico, in 1964, where there seem to be traces left behind by the UFOs. In Socorro, it is possible that there was one witness, a patrolman named Zamora, and it's possible he could have dug those holes himself, but that would make him a liar and a hoaxer, and everybody who knew him say that he's a truthful, honest, serious uh, law officer. So I would say, I would say these CE2 uh, incidents, they are the real bone in my throat. And I don't know how to explain them. I would, though, flip it around and ask, is it likely that if we were being visited by extraterrestrial aircraft for a period now of 70 years, that we would have something like three cases of really difficult to explain Uh, physical traces left behind. I would expect many, many more. That's the interesting part about it, yes. The the lack of verifiable, scientifically valid material evidence. That's one of the first things that I, as a ufologist, have to readily admit right up front. And I think a lot of other ufologists don't want to. They, They want to continue believing and they or they'll avoid the question but i think if we're going to make any progress it's one of the things that we need to face the facts about that at least we in the public don't have that kind of evidence but then again is that the only evidence that's sufficient to substantiate belief yeah yeah now the the, the uh, and uh According to the country's newspaper of record, the New York Times, from last December, somewhere in, I think, hangars in Las Vegas, there are pieces of metal retrieved from UFOs that have compounds unknown on Earth. This is reported 
by Ralph Blumenthal, who is one of the New York Times reporters and who wrote a, an extremely fine article a few years ago about John Mack. Now, if these pieces of metal that were reported last December turn out, number one, to exist, number two, to be examined by scientists of coming from, the, from different approaches who publicly declare them to be compounds unknown to Earth, then I am going to have to surrender. But I must tell you, I am not expecting that to happen. Yeah, I wouldn't expect it to happen either. Because it never uh, happens in the UFO field. We always think we have a smoking gun and it just fizzles. We're not going to fizzle now. I'm going to remind you that we have the Paracast Plus with the ad-free version of this show and the after the Paracast podcast available for prices starting at just $1.49. And don't forget, we're coming up on the fifth anniversary of the Paracast Plus. Almost five years. We introduced the After the Paracast podcast before then. And we're working on some fifth anniversary specials for you. Okay? Big specials. So this is the time to consider signing up for the Paracast Plus. For more information, go to plus.theparacast.com. That's plus. TheParacast.com. David Halper and Gene Steinberg, J. Randall Murphy, you're in. The Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. We also have swag. You know, we have all these exclusive Paracast things that you can buy. We've got like, I guess, 60 or so different items and entails T-shirts, sleeves for notebook computers, iPad cases, mouse pads, the Paracast jumbo tote bag, all sorts of T-shirts and jackets and stuff like that for men and women. We have a Paracast aluminum water bottle. All this stuff, you go to store.theparacast.com, store.theparacast.com. What makes it special is that the items are the best quality, you know, great T-shirts, fabrics, and they have our official logo on them. That's what makes them special in multiple sizes and colors. We even have stuff for children, stuff for women, stuff for men. We have all sorts of sizes, like small up to X large. A lot of good stuff. That's the swag from the Paracast. If you go to store.theparacast.com, stop by and take a shopping tour. Heart-related health problems affect millions of people each year. Maybe you're one of the many who suffer from issues related to angina pain, high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, unbalanced cholesterol, irregular heartbeat, or clogged arteries. There is a solution that doesn't involve expensive prescription drugs that only mask the problem and leave you with horrible side effects. If you are ready to live your life free of sickness, pain, and fear, live your life with increased vitality, energy, and youthfulness, and experience your body healing itself, then you're ready for heart and body extract from Healthy Hearts Club. Here is what one satisfied customer had to say about heart and body extract regarding his angina pain. I haven't had an angina pain uh, since I've been on it. The heart body extract is just so great. I thank God that I was led to this product that's doing so much for me and that can do so much for other people. Call to order your two-month supply of heart and body extract today. Call 1-866-295-5305 or go to hbextract.com. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. We've been mentioning a few times the major update to the Paracast site, the major upgrade to our YouTube channel. Anders is still working on both, but the YouTube channel has already undergone some changes with new artwork. So check the Paracast YouTube channel. Randall? Yeah, that's all looking pretty good, Gene. I'm really looking forward to when we, it finally gets all launched up and we get the whole facelift happening. That's pretty cool. We've got another question in the question bank, actually from our same poster. 
And he says on a similar note from the previous questions uh, about the trace evidence and such, when chroniclers of Israel reported that Elihu, Elijah, I guess, was taken bodily to heaven, he has underlined here, did those chronicles and readers think it was just some mental perception kind of thing, or did they think he literally was taken to another realm? And don't most Orthodox Jews and Christians think it was literal? Well, I'll put on here my, uh, my, my Jewish history hat and say, yeah, I think the author of that story certainly intended it to be literal. I, I would not see it as a UFO. It was definitely an identified flying object. That The belief of the ancient Israelites was that God, like a human king, had his chariotry around him. The 68th Psalm says that the divine chariotry is two myriad, thousands of Shinan, whatever Shinan are. The Lord is among them, Sinai in holiness. So there's absolutely no reason why one of those chariots shouldn't be detached and come and, uh, and pick up Elijah. So I have no problem with understanding the story of Elijah, of Elijah's being carried off in a fiery chariot to heaven. I certainly don't believe it actually happened. Now, what I do believe happened, and what does seem to me to be a UFO, is what Ezekiel sees in his vision in the first chapter. Because there he's describing something that doesn't fit in any of the boxes we might try to stuff it into. It doesn't fit in with the imagery or the art of the ancient Near East. It doesn't fit in with traditional Israelite belief. And it doesn't fit in all that well with modern spaceships either. So that this is something I would call the genuinely unidentified. And that's coming from inside Ezekiel. And I think probably Jung is right to see in the, the, the number four that keeps cropping up there, reference to the quaternity archetype. And this is also something that I'm writing about in the book. Is, is Ezekiel, you might have to help me out here a little bit because I don't have my Bible CD here plugged in. Uh, so, but doesn't he say something about it? You know, he observed a whirlwind coming towards him off from in the distance. And as yeah. it drew closer, he could see that it had, uh, it, it was shaped like a wheel. It had these things resembling faces on the, you know, so we might translate that in our modern times to something like maybe portals with, you know, people looking out of them, that sort of thing. Well, but we really have to force, uh, to force it into that, into that mold. As a, I have a Bible actually right here, so we can uh, we can look at Ezekiel's words. Uh, let's see. That I looked and behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness round about it, and fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming bronze. And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the form of men, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. And I won't uh, read the whole thing, but then he goes on to describe how they have four faces, like the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. And then only after describing these creatures, I saw a wheel upon the earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, they were as, it, and I'm skipping a few words, they were as it were a wheel within a wheel. Uh, when the living creatures went, the wheels went behind them. When the living creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose. I don't think you're going to get a very good UFO sighting out of that. Well, it sounds a lot like some sort of flying construction of some sort. I mean, if we look at a you know, look at some of the drones that we have these days. We've got, you know, they got the circular, many of them have four circular propellers that are surrounded by a circular sort of protection thing. So what do you do with the four faced creatures? Well, this was, you know, there's maybe where some of this symbolism comes in. Perhaps back in those days, I mean, those animals could have been symbols of 
other tribes or nations, or we see them in, in hieroglyphics, for example. And, and storms are just storms, and they are known for their electromagnetic effects. So maybe something happened to them like happened to Calvin and, you know, and, and Charles, where they, there was some EM thing that sent them into a fugue state. Right, and then we're back with Persinger. Right. But that, yeah. that seems to actually make sense. Yeah, uh, which still leaves, and as, as it leaves with uh, Nixon and Parker, leaves open the question of why Ezekiel sees the things he sees. Why doesn't he see something different? And right. I mean, the standard... Oh, sorry. That's, that's okay, go ahead. The, the standard approach is to say, well, this is the iconography of the ancient Near East. But I must say, when I studied this, I couldn't find anything quite like it. I mean, you've got human-faced animals all over the place. The Egyptian sphinx is the, uh, the classic example of it. And then those uh, winged monsters with human faces that you have on, on, on Assyrian sculptures. But hu- human forms with animal faces are very rare. And I can't think of a single one that's like Ezekiel, a, a, a human form with four faces. And of course, Jung would say, well, that's the quaternity, three animal faces and, uh, and a human face. And I think Jung is, is probably closer to the truth than most of the Bible specialists. But then again, I, I mean, I'm not a Bible expert, but it seems that a lot of, at least the King James Version, was created uh, much later by people who like to tell stories, and they found the manuscripts and can pretty much trace it back now to, you know, well after the fact. So, you know, these, these, these could be things just people dreamed up. I doubt if that late. I mean, the King James Bible, in my experience, is really pretty good. That uh, that he, that his translators did the best job they could. I mean, they made some mistakes, but but uh, but by and large, they conveyed the Hebrew and in the New Testament the Greek very well. The problem would be in the in the Hebrew text, which is frequently very jumbled. And I don't know whether that's because, as the conventional scholars say, because there's a lot of rewriting going on in it as it's transmitted or whether we've got a person who is trying to get down on paper something that he's experienced that he really doesn't doesn't understand and likes some things in our dreams that he can't quite grasp, which is a phenomenon I think we know with, with modern UFO sightings also, that people are groped for words to try to describe something that's beyond words. So, uh, one more question from the question bank. We, are you familiar with the Kameda report? The, say the that one, again? The Kameda report from France? No, I'm not. Oh, okay. Hey, guys, we're going to break for some more fun and games. And then back with David Halpern, covering all sorts of things. I was going to start and talk about that dream article, but I think this is more fascinating because we're getting into some real fundamentals about UFOs and other paranormal events with Gene Randall and David, you're in the Paracast. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a thrill a minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors, classic science fiction at its best, available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S 
Com. Long distance travel or long hours in front of a computer can take its toll on your body. Get relief for your neck or back pain when you search Amazon for sunshine pillows, heating wraps, and pads, often listed as an Amazon choice. Why take another pill? Now, from Sunny Bay and by customer demand, we introduce our extra long neck heating wrap, a complete wrap, wide and hands free, and brings fast relief to those who suffer from neck or back pain. You can easily find sunshine pillows on Amazon. Or search Amazon for our new Sunny Bay disposable heat pads. Or look for Sunny Bay heated neck wraps for relief from back pain to menstrual pain and cramps. Sometimes life can be a pain in the neck or back or shoulder. See why our company, Biomed DB Design, has a lifetime 100% positive rating on both Amazon and Etsy. Just go to Amazon.com and search Sunny Bay or call us 253-678-1361. Healthcare reform is confusing, but whether it's finding an affordable insurance plan, keeping your doctor, or being able to afford needed prescriptions, navigating the healthcare system has become a challenge. Control your own healthcare costs and choices with Liberty HealthShare. Liberty HealthShare is not insurance. It is an association of self-pay patients who unite with like-minded people to share the cost of each other's medical needs. Neighbor helping neighbor. Learn more now by going to libertyoncall.org. That's libertyoncall.org. Standing up for what's right. Helping out when things go wrong. Raising our voices alone or together. Seeking the truth and speaking our minds. Not just making records, but breaking them. Fighting for victory on the battlefield and on the playing field. Seeing the world through new eyes and the earth from miles above. Redefining beauty and what it really means to be queen. Making ourselves heard on stage and on screen. Showing the way in Silicon Valley and showing up for others wherever help is needed most. Not just making our mark, but making a difference. Now that's a job for a Girl Scout. Girl Scouts, preparing girls for a lifetime of leadership. Water is the single most important thing your body needs, so you want to be sure it's the best for you and your family. Since 2005, thousands have depended on Berkey Purified Water. The Berkey Guy provides the lowest priced filtration systems in every size. For incredibly delicious water now and in an emergency, get to GoBerkey.com or call 877-886-3653. 877-886-3653. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. We have David Halpern, UFO investigator, religious scholar, man about town who, no, I was going to do something else from an old <laughs> pulp novel who learn in the Orient the powers to cloud men's minds so they cannot see him. That's Lamont Cranston. I love well, those I old radio did shows. Did you ever listen to those things, David? Certainly they came no, up. I'm afraid I didn't. I did they, not. You did not? I did not listen to those shows. Ah. Uh, they used to play them here late at night on uh, AM radio, and I absolutely loved them. I was, I was I, probably I was, after my bedtime. I was just, I was, I was transported back in time to, I don't know when they were, the 40s, Gene? They were the 30s and 40s, yeah. and the shadow starts from the early 30s. And I'll give a very brief description here because I don't want to take away from David's time. A lot of the shadow novels published by Street and Smith were written under an assumed name by Walter B. Gibson, a magician and writer who was a very regular guest on the Long John Neville radio show. He wrote over 300 shadow novels. Of course, Orson Welles was one of the actors who played the shadow on radio. And in a movie from, I think, 1994, Alec Baldwin played Lamont Cranston and the shadow. Let's go on with other stuff. Randall. Right. Yeah, we were just um, 
touching on the question from the question bank about the Kameta report, which um, was, I think it was originally called UFOs and Defense and published in France. It includes a whole bunch of cases there that they went into in quite some detail. I guess the, the inference of the question is, you know, are those types of reports is all as easily explained as it's purely mental phenomena as the rest. But I guess if you're not familiar with the report, then that would be kind of tough to answer. It would be. Okay. That was a quick answer. That was a quick one. Yeah. <laughs> there are things that I have not considered, which is certainly true, which is certainly true. Well, what do you I, think, Gene? What is you're familiar with the Kameda report, right? You can download the various PDFs and, and read through them. And, yeah. and so you, you get a, a pretty good idea about what they're getting at there. I suppose that if you're dealing with it from a national defense perspective, then we're back to that sort of if you see everything as, an, as a nail, then you're was it inclined to hit it with a hammer, right? So if you're... Well, yeah. If the only tool is a hammer, you see everything as a nail. Right. Okay. So I had it backwards, but <laughs> but essentially, I guess if you if you're looking at it from a de- defense department perspective, then you're going to be looking at them as alien craft that have the potential to cause a security problem. And certainly, they never have. We know that after seventy years, or or so some people say. I mean, there's others who would say, okay, well. You know, we've got the UFOs and nukes people who say, well, they've, I guess if we were to take your perspective, we had a number of people who've had these experiences near nuclear facilities, I mean, nuclear weapons facilities, missile bases, and so on. And they've been pursued by our military. So if, if actual aliens aren't posing a security threat, maybe it's the perception Conceivably, but it seemed, there seems to be no reason to think the aliens are. I mean, in her book, or, or what is it that came out about uh, eight, ten years ago, Leslie Kane says that we need to watch out that UFOs are a hazard to air travel, which sounds plausible enough, but it is striking if these things have been flying around for 70 years, there have never been an accident. Then again, I suppose the you know, we, we'd cite back to a number of crashes that are connected directly with UFO reports, specifically military ones. I mean, you know, not the, the least of which would be the Mantell case type of thing. Which I, I think but, has been pretty convincingly explained. Yeah, reasonably well. So, but Stanton Friedman, eminent ufologist, he, he would say, well, yeah, he was too good a pilot to think it was just a big balloon he was chasing after. Really? My my sense is that nobody knew about those skyhook balloons back then. That, strictly speaking, it was an unidentified flying object that that very few people were aware of their existence. Right. Uh, So, you know, that's what we're left with, is that on one hand we say, well, he he should have been a good enough pilot to realize what was going on. He wouldn't normally have crashed his airplane. But uh, I guess accidents happen. But then other people have cited a whole number of other incidents as well. And the one that really gets me, okay, if we have to really look at it at a case, one that I thought was fairly easily written off at first was the 52 Washington, D.C. case, because there they did identify some temperature inversions, and they did determine that at least one of the radar returns was off something that was conventional. I believe it was something, a barge or a boat in the river. However, there was so much other stuff involved with that, people seeing the lights, two separate radar stations tracking them. And in one instance, they had radar tracking, vector a jet to intercept these objects. And the pilot saw the objects at the same time as the radar stations were tracking the plane. And when they came into visual view, the pilot asked what he should do and whether or not he should try firing upon them. And nobody knew what to do. So they surrounded his plane, clearly saw them while his plane and these objects were being tracked on radar. And then they just streaked off into the distance. 
Now, was everybody just having a hallucination? The radar operators, the people watching on the ground, the pilot? That just doesn't seem reasonable. No, I would agree with you that I think that where you've got the radar, then a psychological explanation does not work that well. You know, I could see where, say, where you only have the radar return and no visual. Then you might wonder, or if you have the visual and no radar, but in a case where you've got both, and apparently there was quite a number of these cases. Ruppelt goes into that in his, one of his classic books, a report on unidentified flying objects. He visited air bases where commanders of those bases had had their jets scrambled after them a number of times. He opens his book with a case of a UFO being intercepted in daylight, closing in on it, and actually firing upon the thing. You've got a really good question for me, which I can't answer. But I'm going to be very unfair, and I'm going to flip it around and ask, ask you, what do we do with the cases where there are radar returns, but nobody sees anything? Or where people see things and they're not direct, detected on radar? That's good. I suppose you could say, well, maybe they have radar cloaking and visual cloaking. So they can manipulate that at will. They can make their craft look like whatever they want us to think they want us to look at. They can make it invisible to our radar or they can make it available, depending on how they want to manipulate our perception of them. At which point the hypothesis becomes a bit too Brodian. It, it, It changes shape too much. But that's what makes it interesting. Hey guys, we got a break. Let's persist with this in our next segment with David Jean and Randall. You're in the Paracast. Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. Most of you know that heart disease is the number one silent killer in the U.S. What if I told you for just $54.95 a month you could fight against heart disease naturally? At Heart and Body Extract, we've been helping thousands of people get back to a healthier heart. Don't just take my word for it. Check out all of the success stories at hbextract.com. Or to order, call 866-295-5305. That's 866-295-5305. hbextract.com. Don't risk it when you can take charge of it. Do the letters IRS give you anxiety? I'm Dan Pilla. I've defended people from the IRS for more than 40 years. My book, How to Get Tax Amnesty, created the tax resolution industry and is responsible for helping hundreds of thousands of people. It can help you, too. If you're a non-filer or facing IRS enforcement right now, your case is unique. You need real help, not cookie-cutter advice. My clients get my personal attention. Buy my book at danpilla.com and get a free consultation directly with me. That's danpilla.com. Let's start solving your tax problem right now. USA Radio News with Chris Barnes. Residents along the South Atlantic coast are being told to prepare now for the likelihood they'll be facing a major hurricane in about five days. Tropical Storm Florence is expected to become a hurricane later today and will gain strength as it heads towards the southeast U.S. Heavy rains take lives in Texas. That story from USA Radio's John Clemens. 14 inches of rain fell in Corsican, Texas since Friday, but the flash floods proved deadly in Fort Worth, claiming three lives. A mother who was operating her car with her two-year-old daughter inside were swept off the road by the wake from passing vehicles. Authorities also found the body of a man in his submerged vehicle around 2.30 Saturday afternoon. Steelworkers nationwide are prepping for a possible strike against U.S. Steel. If they pull the trigger on that, it would be the first since 1986. This is USA Radio News. There's no question you need omega-3s. But which form should you take? Fish oil or krill oil? Scientists have debated this for years. Luckily, there's a new solution to satisfy everyone. It's called Krill Omega 50 Plus. It combines ultra-pure fish oil and joint-soothing krill oil together in just one tiny pill. It's so powerful, it can promote the health of your heart and your arteries. And if that wasn't enough, it can also boost your joint comfort in just days. We're so sure Krill Omega 
Omega 50 Plus will work for you. We'll even send you a free bottle to put to the test. The debate is over. It's not fish oil or krill oil. It's both. And now it's free. Just pay $4.95 for shipping and claim your free bottle. Call now. 1-800-399-6392. 1-800-399-6392. That's 1-800-399-6392. Message and data rates may apply. Individual results may vary. See website for details. But hey, I'm buying a huge flat screen TV so I can finally see it without my glasses. Why not just get LASIK at the LASIK Vision Institute? That's what I'm doing. Uh, my glasses and contacts are a pain. I'd love to finally get rid of these, but who can afford LASIK? You can. Because the LASIK Vision Institute is offering dramatically low prices and an absolutely free consultation. Just text DO33 to 350350. The LASIK Vision Institute has already performed over a million procedures. They use the latest FDA-approved LASIK technology that helps the majority of patients achieve 20-20 vision for a fraction of what others charge. Better vision, better value. The LASIK Vision Institute. Make this the year you finally get LASIK. For a free consultation plus an extra 20% discount, text DO33 to 350-350. 350-350. You'll see for free if LASIK is right for you. That's D O 33 to 350-350. Hey, this is Marie D. Jones, the author of This Book is from the Future, and you are listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. We were just talking about that connection again, where if we are dealing with an alien intelligence with advanced technology, we could have as you know an overlapping set of circumstances on our Venn diagram here, where it, you know in a number of cases is it is purely mental. In a, other cases, there is a an actual physical craft or something that is seen that it corresponds to an objective reality and then there's all of this deception that could be taking place because they're capable of doing that well so we think as a as, as a uh, as a case the famous father deal case i mean uh, the, the from from papua new guinea in uh, in june of uh, 1959 i mean this is uh this is famous in the literature because we have what seems to be an unimpeachable witness, a uh, an Anglican missionary uh, in, in Papua. That the, his account of the the sighting was undersigned by something like twenty out of thirty five of the Papuans in his flock, and he describes the uh, close up observation of discs with human beings, he, ha- he has no doubt they were human beings, walking around on their decks. I-, I say he has no doubt they were human beings, even though they're luminous. And at times he thinks of them as angels. They're certainly not the conventional Whitley Strieber grays. So what exactly is he seeing? Now, the Martin Kottmeyer, who was one of the ufologist, and I would say, I call him a ufologist, even though he's a skeptic, whom I most respect, has uh, examined a map of the objects that Gill saw and found that they correspond pretty closely to bright stars and planets. And to say that they're stars and planets would explain why they seem to appear and disappear as the clouds thicken and disperse. And yet, what Gill and the Papuans see is not stars and planets. They see disks with men walking around on top of them. So I would have to say, yes, they are seeing the heavenly bodies, which are triggering religious vision, and that the two, the, the two explanations have to function together. But I guess that depends on I, you, these things would have to be pretty close in order for someone to actually see people on them. I mean, it, otherwise, we're just sort of imagining it, filling it in. If if what all we're talking about is a speck of, of light off in the distance that looks like, well, there's something moving around on it. Well, OK, maybe that's a star or a planet and you're just filling in the rest. But if the thing takes up an appreciable amount of 
degrees in you know, arc minutes across the sky, say it's as big as a plate held at arm's length or something, and you can see these beings clearly walking around, then you're dealing with something that cannot possibly be a star or planet, regardless of what position in the sky it is. And so then, on the sun, the, the Fatima could have fallen. Well, you know, we've provided a plausible explanation, technological one for that. In the case of this particular New Guinea case, well, perhaps if we're talking about real aliens, that the craft itself and the people were not really there. They were projections some of some type that they have the technology to do, maybe some sort of holographic projection to display in a theatrical sense a vision for these people and then to later see what how it unfolds how do these people react and so on there's no reason to believe in other words our assumptions at the beginning are that the beings were human that they were walking around on the craft but maybe the craft was simply behind the entire facade and making the people believe that what they were seeing was this particular presentation and I wonder if a third party listening to us would wonder, which is the crazier hypothesis? <laughs> that or mine, that people can see stars and planets, which appear to them as discs with human beings walking around on top of them. Right. Well, again, that depends on how many arc minutes you're talking about this thing covering the sky is. If, it, you know, if it's the size of looking at, say, an automobile at the end of your driveway, it's not going to be as... A star. It doesn't matter if you know, Venus happens to also be off in the distance at the end of your driveway. You're going to be able to tell the difference between the two pretty readily. Unless the star is the trigger for something that comes from inside. Sure. You know, once again, but how many other people also saw this? That's to have that many people have the same sort of hallucination, essentially, is what we're talking about. Yeah, that's that would be really remarkable. It would it would be very remarkable. But then again, I think, so, I think that's what UFOs are very remarkable. <laughs> that's true. But either way, this this is what uh, this is a kind of thing I was really hoping to get into is that maybe there's some possible way that we can overlap these these ideas. So that, no, people really aren't seeing what they think they're seeing, and yet there still is an objective reality to it in some cases. I think that's John Keel's approach, wasn't it? John Keel, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, well, I heard that. I was just looking for Gene's comment on that. No, I'm letting you comment. Oh, I'm not as familiar with Keel as you are. Oh, okay. Well, John Keel had talked about a lot of fascinating things sometimes i wondered whether he was totally serious about some things because everything to him was paranoia and uh, demonic interactions with ufos okay yeah so that wouldn't be so much like keel then as i don't know what it would be like actually more i guess what we've seen in some sci-fi that's taken place where, you know, okay, here I go. I'm going to have to mention Star Trek because that's the first place I saw the idea of a cloaking device or beings that could change shape because of technology. Or, in fact, there is one episode where a particular being with a lot of technology is able to make it look like to the local residents that they are a creature from their mythological past that's come back to claim their territory and the the crew uh of the of starfleet they recognize what's really going on and they have to try and resolve this without uh, contaminating them and uh ruining the ruining what's going on with the prime directive you see this is the big thing about star trek though the prime directive says don't interfere and in every episode where it involves contact with a more primitive culture, they end up interfering somehow. Right. There's the one who watches the watchers, I believe, from the Next Generation episode. And that is a really excellent portrayal of exactly that type of thing. Because the captain, Picard, ultimately has to take one of these um, 
primitive peoples onto the starship and explain that he's not God. Sounds intriguing. Yeah, if you ever get a chance to watch it. That's one of the things I love about sci-fi is that it deals with those kinds of issues, bigger issues, more complex issues about existence and the way that we look at the world and how our assumptions about things really reflect our, our reflection of our socialization and our knowledge of the time. Well, you're not a Trekkie, are you, David? No, I'm afraid not. I'm afraid not. I had a roommate many years ago who was, and, I, and he had a portable TV, and we used to watch it at the dinner table. But that was very long time ago, and it didn't. I don't think it made much impression on me. You're not even a recovering Trekker. Actually, it's Trekker, not Trekkie. Indeed, they're bringing back Captain Picard, Patrick Stewart, in a new series. But you don't want to hear about that, do you? Huh? More to come. Really? <laughs> With Gene and David and... Uh, Randall, you're in the Paracast. You are listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. As you know, neighbors, web hosting can be pretty cheap, but not all hosting is the same. DreamHost wins best of awards year after year. You get unlimited disk space, unlimited bandwidth, and even the low-cost plans put your sites on high-performance SSDs. Want to know more about what DreamHost has to offer? Go to technightowl.com slash host. Once again, that's technightowl.com slash host. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. You've been hearing Dr. Wallach talking about 90 essential nutrients, keeping the body healthy. GCNteam.com now has Beyond Tangy Tangerine tablets, 60 plant-derived minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 amino acids, packed in a powerful tablet. But that's not it. 160,000 auric points, a knockout punch to free radicals. Call 877-878-4203 or go to GCNteam.com. That's 877-878-4203. When you use public Wi-Fi, hackers and identity thieves can see anything you do online. Embarrassing photos, your web history, even your passwords. That's why I use private internet access to encrypt my internet connection for less than 10 cents a day. Sign up now at privateinternetaccess.com and in just a few minutes, you'll be browsing anonymously and only sharing what you want to share. Privateinternetaccess.com. It's time to protect your online privacy. If you're talking, they will hear you Why are we getting killed like this? Kyle's not here. Got caught drinking beer in the park a couple of nights ago. Really? Yeah. Zero tolerance. He's out for the season. Harsh. Hey, he knew not to drink. We've made that clear to all of our kids, right? Uh, no, not really. Bill, if we don't tell them what we expect and why they shouldn't drink, how are they going to know? Talk. They hear you. Hear you. You can do it if you try. Non-attorney paid spokesperson. Could your house go into foreclosure? Are you behind on your mortgage payments? Does it seem like the bank has no interest in helping you save your home and you feel like you have nowhere to turn for help? Then we have good news for you. Foreclosure Protection Services can help save your home as they specialize in foreclosure assistance. That's all they do. If you're behind on your mortgage payments, being threatened with foreclosure, have been denied a loan modification, or been the victim of a predatory loan, it's critical that you call Foreclosure Protection Services now at 800-667-9035. Their network of attorneys and their agents are available to speak to you now. If you're behind on your mortgage payments, Foreclosure Protection Services can help stop the foreclosure process. Call today before it's too late. New laws are in effect that may save your home. Call Foreclosure Protection Services now at 800-667-9035. 800-667-9035. That's 800-667-9035.
No matter how large or small your digging project may be, no matter how urban or rural, you must always call 811 before any digging project. 811 is our national one call number, alerting your local utility companies to come out and mark any lines they have near your dig site. So before you do this or this, make sure you do this. For digging projects big or small, make the call to 811, brought to you by Common Ground Alliance. This is Micah Hanks of the Gray Alien Report, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. So that's okay. I think about people I know who didn't get on with modern stuff. You do not have a smartphone, do you, David? Uh, no. That might be smart. I'm impressed. I, neither do I. So. Woohoo. Ah, good. I have one, uh, <laughs> one, one, one fellow primitive. In terms of primitives, our late friend Jim Mosley was the ultimate primitive. He had an electric typewriter. He did not have a computer. He had a regular yeah. phone. He did not have a cell phone of any kind. He did not even have voicemail. So there, you didn't reach him too uh, bad. Yeah, well, I think... He used to refer to it as the dread internet. So what then inspired you to either become a UFO investigator or to write a book about all of this? Because for me, kind of this whole sci-fi thing and UFOs tended to go really hand in hand. It was like space and adventure and what's going on and it's a mystery. And so, so well, how, did it, how did it happen with you? I was 12 years old, and I read Gray Barker's They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers. And I immediately recognized it as the truth. How did I, do, how did I recognize it? Because he talked about a reality that was so terrible that it had to be silenced. No one could speak of it. And that was the reality I knew from my house, that my mother was dying slowly and nobody would talk about it. So oh. when I read similar things in Gray Barker, in mythic terms, like Shaver, then I recognized this as the real truth that nobody was willing to tell me. So the tone of the story really resonated with your personal situation in life. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, that's that's Absolutely. fair. Okay, and I and and I think you know that I don't think it's just me. I think that all of these stories, perhaps this is the crux of my book, that all of these stories are myths that can that come sometimes from one or two people, like Betty and Barney Hill, and yet resonate with thousands and eventually millions of others. Well, there's no question that that happens, and. I find that very fascinating, too. And it's one of the reasons that uh, I, I'm really looking forward to having a look at your book. It's going to be right on the shelf there along with uh, Young. So. Well, Randall, I look forward to having a debate partner, debate opponent like you. <laughs> I mean, that it's, it is very stimulating. Yeah. It's, ideas. Sure. It's a discussion with me. And I guess for me, I, I take the classic position of 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 using it as an intellectual tool i i don't mean to certainly don't mean to offend anyone and i'm often misunderstood that way but that's certainly not what it's about i know we had a debate going on for quite a while about the eth and the paracast forums but like things like that it petered out let's hope this one will not well that's because you hear the same thing over and over again for so many times that after a while, you just want to find something new to stimulate your mind. And I think that's what went on with Valet. He uh, was so tired of the extraterrestrial hypothesis and ships and nuts and bolts phenomena. And he was writing another book and he had to figure out something different that was stimulating for him in his quite brilliant mind. So he came up with the, his whole dimensions hypothesis, sort of alternate realities and so on. Valet is now very popular. 
I mean, one of the most remarkable phenomena for me in the past the past uh, year or so has been the extent to which UFOs have become uh, respectable. The New York Times is now smiling upon them. The Washington Post runs an op-ed complaining that UFOs aren't taken seriously enough. The London Review of Books has a glowing article about UFOs and particularly about ballet. And this, to me, is a phenomenon as extraordinary as any that we've talked oh, about so far. Definitely, definitely. I, we're in newer times. I wouldn't exactly call it disclosure, but it's certainly uh, a new era of acceptance. To me, it's fantastic. I mean, the New York Times used to be the most contemptuous, take the most contemptuous position on UFOs. Now they, last month, they ran a piece on those 1952 Washington sightings, which basically said that uh, the temperature inversions didn't explain them. Well, they don't. I mean, they explain some of them. Like I did, when you really dig into the case and you start looking at all of the evidence, there's a lot more there than temperature inversions and lens flares. And the New York Times, for some reason, felt it important to bring that back. Something is changing. I can always suggest here, there is a plot involved. There is the goal of gradual disclosure, at least in terms of the ETH making people accept the possibility over the years that there is definitely life out there. There's even water on the moon and Mars and lots of other planets. So we have those conditions. If it's liquid water, you know where that leads to. So it's very possible we have life out there. And that's a way of making people accept a reality if UFOs were ex- extraterrestrial. But then maybe, <laughs> doesn't that, though, Gene, is sort of the call into question maybe an ulterior motive? I mean, I mean the whole uh, the To the Stars thing with the threat identification program turned out to be actually something for the Defense Department because they were concerned about them from a defense perspective. So making UFOs respectable kind of gives Trump his whole uh, rationalization for creating the Space Force. So the Space Force will be renamed Federation. No, that's not going to happen. Which I think if I were a Trekker, I would understand. Yes, but since you're not a Trekker, it can't possibly happen. Except I read the other day that now a prominent Democrat is in favor of a Space Force. Or maybe Trump is a sci-fi fan and we don't know it, a closet sci-fi fan. I don't think he ever has given an answer to UFOs. At one time, his press secretary, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, was asked what he thought about UFOs. And his response, and she had no response. And what she says, I'll have to ask him. And of course, with that response, you know what happens then? Nothing. It never happens. David Halperin, we could have done this for another two hours. I you- would have been a delight, Gene, and I, I, am, I am honored to be on this forum with you and Randall. Well, thanks a lot. I mean, your perspective is something really, truly different. David Halpern, tell our listeners where we can find more of all that stuff you do. At www.davidhalperin, that's one word, D-A-V-I-D-H-A-L-P-E-R-I-N dot net. And in about a year and a half, my book, Intimate Alien, The Hidden Story of the UFO. You know what? I can't wait. I really can't wait, and that's why we keep talking about it. We'll talk about it between now and then, David, and build up demands so the day it comes out. People will be lining up in the streets screaming, no, wanting to buy your book. Oh, that would be lovely, wouldn't it? You deserve it, my friend. You deserve it. Okay. You can find us on Twitter if you look for The Paracast. We have two official, official, not unofficial, real, 100% genuine, official Paracast fan clubs. On Facebook, if you like Facebook. If you don't, we'll work out some other kind of solution. We're not really committed to Facebook if you don't like it. And I was mentioning after the PowerCast, because that's an exclusive feature of the PowerCast Plus, what this means is you get two radio shows for a modest price. One of them is the PowerCast 
free of all the network ads. That's why it's over 41 minutes shorter. Okay, instead of network ads, you have a couple of seconds of silence before the next segment. That's how we do it. Better quality audio. So David, he has a great, a great landline connection will be even greater after this. To learn more about the Paracast Plus, go to plus.theparacast.com, plus.theparacast.com. David Halper and my friend, thank you for joining us on the Paracast. Thank you for having me, Gene, and we'll talk later. The Paracast. Featuring Gene Steinberg and Christopher O'Brien is a copyrighted presentation of Making the Impossible Incorporated. Tune in next week for a new adventure in The Paracast. <laughs>